Well, welcome. Uh, today we continue the Livestock Management CDE webinar series uh, for the 2019 uh, contest. Today, Dr. Kathy Anderson is going to join us and she's going to visit about the equine station, uh, which will have a disciplinary focus on equine health. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kathy Anderson for this particular webinar. Kathy? Um, hi, thank you. Yes, I've been doing the equine station for some time, and so this year's focus on the equine side of it is going to be um, on the um, on basically healthcare. And so we're going to go over some basic things as far as um, health, parasites, dental, and a few other kinds of things to help your kids get ready for this contest. Okay, so just in general, some things that, that um, they should be prepared to do or should know um, as they're getting ready for the contest, and here's just some different things, and I'll touch on some of them here, and you all also have these, and so you can take some time and help the kids find some of the information on. But basically, they need to know what the core equine diseases are. Um, according to the AEP, which is the American Association of Equine Practitioners, they're going to identify some diseases as core diseases, which are ones that all horses should be vaccinated for. And then there's others that are risk-based diseases. Okay, we want them to also know how to take the vital signs. Uh, look at the vaccination schedules for the three main groups of horses we're concerned about, um, our adult horses, our foals, and then our broodmares, as they do vary just a little bit. Where are they gonna vaccinate them at? And then some basic emergency care for the horses. And then really just to recognize what a sick horse kind of looks like. So to dive into this first portion, and then we'll get into some parasites and dental stuff also. Um, really kind of we just talk about looking at the horse's overall appearance. Um, in the past, we've gone over body condition, you know, how fat or skinny they are, making sure there's no sudden weight losses, looking to see what their hair coat is. It looked you know, overall nice and healthy. Um, have they shed their normal winter hair coat and some of those different kinds of things. We want them to be able to take their vital signs and know what a horse's vital signs are. And so basically we're talking about the temperature, pulse, and respiration. And with that, so we might actually have the, um, the, the contestants go through and do this. And so for the temperature on a horse, it basically should be um, a normal temperature, should be somewhere between 99 and 101. So we generally say it should be right around 100 degrees for a normal healthy horse. It's taken rectally, as you can see here. Anytime they start getting something up over 103, we consider that they have a fever and something's going on, okay? Um, normal temperature can be affected by a lot of different kinds of things. It can be elevated a little bit if it's really hot, if they've been working and some of those kinds of things. However, anytime it starts to get up over 103, then we consider that getting to be a little bit in the abnormal feverish kind of stage. Um, the next one is part of our vitals is to take their, their heart rate, okay? And really, with a horse's heart rate, it should be between 30 and 40 beats per minute. We generally take it for 15 seconds and then multiply that times four. And you can take it a couple of different ways. You can use your hand underneath their jaw here. You can also take it down there in their pastern. Or if you have a stethoscope, it's going to be taken down here kind of sternly. And it can be kind of faint because he's a big animal. Things are sitting pretty deep. But remember, it should be 30 to 40 beats in a minute, and you can take it for 15 seconds and multiply that by four. By four. Um, naturally, different kinds of things can elevate it, such as newborn foals, their heart rate's gonna be a little bit faster. Exercise, pain, excitement, all those things can kind of change it. The other one of the vital signs that, that we routinely try to take are the respiration. And at rest for a normal horse, it should be somewhere between eight and 16 breaths in a minute. And it's pretty simple to take our heart rate, excuse me, the respiration rate, where really we're just watching that horse breathe. And so we should look in their flank or put your hand over their nostril and look for one inhale, one exhale, and that's one respiration. Um, whenever, again, we take it for 15 seconds and multiply that by four. So in a 15 second time span, you only might get one. Um, again, there's a lot of things that can elevate that. So anytime exercise, pain, fever, hot weather, if there's bad air, those kinds of things can elevate it. But that should be what you um, can see with, with um, just kind of a normal, normal horse at rest. Okay, so to talk a little bit about some of these diseases, and I'll touch on these just a little bit, but the core vaccines um, or the core diseases that have been identified by, by AAP, which again is the American Association of Equine Practitioners, that kind of set the base for a lot of the way that we medicate and treat horses, is we have encephalomyelitis, which is also known as sickness, tetanus, 
West Nile, West Nile virus, and rabies. And yes, there's other diseases we vaccinate for, but these have been documented or, or determined by AAP as the core vaccines that every horse anywhere should be vaccinated for. So just a little bit on some of these. Encephalomyelitis, which we also call sleeping sickness, there's really three strains of it. We've got the Eastern, um, Western, and Venezuelan. Throughout the Midwest, we're mainly concerned about vaccinating for the Eastern and Western. You can see the Eastern has a very high mortality rate, which means those very highly likely if a horse gets it, they will die, okay? Transmitted between birds and mosquitoes to the horse, and um, the horse really is just a dead-end host. The Western, they're gonna get sick, but it's not as high a mortality, only about a 10 to 30% mortality, and does go through the birds to the horse. The other one that we're not as concerned about here in the Midwest, but as you move to the southern regions it is, is the Venezuelan strain. Again, you can see it's got a very high mortality. It can be transmitted from horse to horse, and it can also be transmitted um, through people, and it is more found in the southern regions. It is a disease that um, you have to vaccinate for if your horses are traveling through the southern region, so that's important to know. Signs of all of these is pretty similar. Naturally, the severity is going to change, so they're all going to get some type of fever um, pretty quick, and it's going to be very high up in that 106 range. They're going to be real sensitive to sound. They will tend to get brain lesions. As the name says, it's an encephalitis type of thing, so there's a lot of drowsiness and circling and different kinds of things. Generally, they'll have a permanent brain damage if they survive it, um, and they don't, it doesn't really last very long. So it's kind of nasty, but it does have a very good vaccine. Tetanus, another one of our core diseases. Um, it's caused just by what we can get tetanus from, so the, the um, clostridium tetanide that's in the soil. Stepping on a, a, a nail, bad things like that, cuts can cause a horse to get tetanus, just like with us, okay? Indicators that they've got tetanus, you know, there's a prolapse of the third eyelid, they don't walk very well. Um, mortality is very high, you can see between 80 and 100 um, percent, if, whether you treat them or not. The good thing with tetanus is we have very, very good vaccines, and so there's really not a reason to vaccine, to, for a horse not to be protected against tetanus. A little thing that's confusing is there are two different types of tetanus vaccines. So if you see, look for a tetanus antitoxin, this is really for an animal that's not been vaccinated from tetanus before, so say our newborn foals, and this really just provides immediate protection. It does not build those long-term antibodies. So a lot of times we'll recommend that we give a newborn foal a tetanus antitoxin. The tetanus toxi, toxoid is the true vaccine that they will actually develop antibodies from. So your newborn foals, probably many folks will like to give them their tetanus antitoxin in the first you know, day that they're born, but then back when we start their regular vaccination program, that vaccine will contain the tetanus toxoid, and this is the one that we use on the adult horses as our booster over, the, over each year. Okay, another one of the core ones is West Nile virus. Um, it's probably the newest one. Now it's still been around, I'd say, since about 2002 or so, somewhere in there. Anyway, it again, is an also, it's also a neurologic type thing, and so just looking at a horse, you won't know if it has West Nile or if it potentially has encephalitis, okay? Yes, they can test them, but the outward signs, except for some specific things, are gonna start off looking pretty similar because they'll start off with a fever, and then also they have a variety of different neurological signs that you can see here. And some of the characteristics for West Nile is that they'll have muscle um, tremors, they kind of get a, a, a head tilt and twitching, whereas you, your sleeping sickness horses will get more of a circling kind of gait. But they're getting pretty serious by the time they get into those situations. Um, West Nile, it's not as high mortality. Um, only about a third of the horses um, will die. The good thing with West Nile now is because it's been around a bit, there is a good vaccine for it. Many of our horses have developed titers against it, so it is not as scary a disease as what it was when it first broke and first came out. So again, we've got a, a vaccine for adult horses, kind of recommended to happen that you give it before the mosquito season, as most all of our others are. And then if you have horses in the warmer clients in the southern, portion of the country, then they recommend that also you maybe even still do that um, more often as much as twice a year. Um, rabies, again, just like in anything else, horses can get rabies um, bitten by um, an infected host, and so signs are a lot of different kinds of things. They do get viciousness, uh, facial paralysis, anorexia, a lot of nasty things if they do get rabies. Um, I just saw, as I was looking from this today, 
Um, this is from 05. However, there, we do have had two reported cases of rabies in the state of Nebraska this year or last year down the southwest portion of the, of the state. Used to be it wasn't as big a concern, but because we do have a very good vaccine and we do seem to get rabid horses in the state every year, it really is suggested that we do vaccinate for rabies. Okay, so the next set of diseases, and these are also ones if you're a horse person, you've heard about them, are what we call the risk-based risk diseases. And uh, the biggest ones that we're concerned in our area of the country are the rhinopneumonitis, influenza, and strangles. There are additional ones, but because they're not as big a concern here in our state, I'm not gonna touch on those, okay? So um, there's a couple different strains of the rhino, and that's one that you will hear of kind of some nasty things or scary things going on with it. Um, so the EHV1, EHV4 types of rhino are the two most common ones that we hear about, and the outward signs, you're not gonna know much difference between them and even the EHM, which is more the neurological form. Initially, they're all gonna look like the similar things, and these similarities are gonna be just like a horse with influenza. They're gonna get um, a cough, a fever, a nasal discharge, and you're not gonna be able to tell what the difference is, okay? EHV1, um, for your pregnant broodmares, it can cause them to abort in later term of gestation, and so we have a, a separate vaccine that we need to give those pregnant mares. Um, they all, they both will have a respiratory disease. EHV1 can form into what we call EHM, okay, which is a paralysis in a neurological form of the EHV1. EHV4 is really just a respiratory kind of issue. They're going to get sick, they're going to go off, and um, so more of a nuisance type of thing, but they don't very often, you don't very often lose them from it. So for the respiratory form of the EHV1 and EHV4, we do vaccinate all of our horses for that. It is in our core vaccines and then, or, or in our routine vaccines, and then many people will additionally vaccinate for those horses every three or four months when they're traveling around. The EHV, EHM, which is a form of EHV1, there's not a specific vaccine for it, um, and it's not that common, but it is highly um, contagious if some horses do get it. Then remember our pregnant mares, they're a little bit different. You're going, to, you're going to vaccinate them against the respiratory form, but we also have to protect them against the abortive form of EHV1. And so we'll vaccinate them specific at the fifth, seventh, and nine month of gestation. And the product that we need to use for that separate, um, there's really only two on the market, and that's Pneumobort K and Prodigy. And those are specific to protect those mares against the abortive form of our rhino. A little bit on flu, um, the outward signs, again, it's just a respiratory kind of thing. You're not gonna be able to tell the difference between this and some of the others. It's typically not fatal. They're just sick. They'll have a cough, maybe a stotty nose, a fever, go off feed. You're not gonna be able to work them very hard. Um, we do have a fairly good vaccine for them, and it's both available as an intramuscular, as most of them are, or an intranasal type of form. And again, kind of this one, it will be part of your annual vaccines. And then many times we do give those in addition every three or four months. And just like any respiratory thing, it's pretty highly contagious. Strangles is, is the other one that I'll mention a little bit. It's caused by the um, bacteria or caused by strep equi. Um, it's really abscesses within the lymph nodes. It'll start off here, kind of like this horse is with a fever, snotty nose. So you don't know if he's coming down with strangles, influenza, rhino, you don't know what he's coming down with. Characteristic for a horse with strangles is that they will get swellings in their lymph nodes. So this guy's getting just a little bit here. This is a foal that's got a pretty significant abscess. And usually they're gonna burst. You can see that it's starting to burst here. And so it can be a pretty big concerning. Um, the disease itself won't kill them, but if they have some complications from it, such as this guy, if it blocks off his air passage, if he stops eating, those are the secondary things that can cause you to lose some of these horses. Um, there's been a lot of debate over the years if you should vaccinate for it. Now there is both an injectable, which goes in the muscle, or an intranasal type of um, strangles vaccine. And more veterinarians have a little bit more faith in the intranasal one. It's one that folks really need to consult a veterinarian with to decide what their plan of action against strangles actually is, or also known as distemper. Okay, so as far as our vaccination schedule for most of our adult horses, we're gonna assume that they've been on a regular vaccination program, that they've already had their boosters. And so typically here in Nebraska, we're gonna give it prior to the mosquito season. So we're talking somewhere um, usually in April, I would say. 
and uh, they're going to get an annual booster for the sleeping sickness, and we're more concerned about Eastern Western. If you're hauling horses to Texas, Florida, Arizona, some of those kinds of air areas, then probably you'll want to also give the Venezuelan form. Uh, the other ones that we'll give them is the tetanus, influenza, rhino, West Nile, rabies, West Nile virus, and also rabies is kind of the annual things. Some of these can be given in combination. Um, rabies is a single injection. West Nile now I think is also a single injection. Then we also like to give them for the respiratory types of problems, the influenza, the rhino, in addition to give that about every three or four months. So that's our horses that are adults. The foals, the newborn foals, they basically are born with no immunity. They'll get a little bit from the mare when they first nurse those mares. And so at birth, we want to give them that tetanus antitoxin to give them some immediate protection from, from um, tetanus. And then somewhere between four and six months of age, there's been some changes in thoughts of the veterinarians and stuff if this should start at three or four. And so I always say consult with a veterinarian when you need to start it. But they will have basically the same kinds of vaccines as our adult horses. But this will be their initial. So all of these are going to need a booster. One or two boosters depends on the product that they use. 30 to 60 late, days later, and that all depends on the product you use. But no way can you give these horses the, the babies one injection. They need an initial and at least one or two other boosters to get their antibody titers where they need to be. And these guys also oftentimes will go ahead and recommend that you give them the flu and rhino every 60 days. Broodmares, I mentioned those just a little bit. In the fifth, seventh, and ninth month of gestation, we need to vaccinate them for the abortiform of rhino. Um, and then the other thing that's a little bit different with them is that for their core vaccines, okay, the basic annual ones, it's the same stuff that we'll give these mares, but we want to give it to them at least 30 days before they're due to full. Then they get some immunity um, antibodies built up in the colostrum of their milk. So then when those foals initially nurse, the newborn foal will have some early protection against these diseases until they're old enough to go ahead and actually have a, have an, have, um, be vaccinated and start on their vaccination series themselves. Just a little bit more on the vaccine types of things as far as where we're going to vaccinate them at. Um, the intranasal one, really, it's mainly just available for the strangles and the influenza. And that's really just a little tiny catheter that just goes in the nostril of the horse. And many veterinarians feel that for those types of diseases, it's way more effective than doing the injection sites. Most all of your vaccines are going to be intramuscular, and so the preferred area is on the horse's neck. And so you kind of draw a triangle down below the crest of his neck, in front of his scapular shoulder bone, and down here where it's above the vertebrae, and look for an area right in the middle of that is where we look to, to do those injections. Sure, you'll hear some people do it in the hip or in the pectorals, and those are really a, a lower preference. And so I always say this is where we're going to do a vaccine. They're generally going to be small volume, less than 10 cc's, so that's really the per preferred location to do these kind of um, vaccines for your horses, okay? Um, nursing foals, you don't really inject them in the neck. Many of them, will, we will go ahead and give those in the neck. You don't want their necks to get sore, so they stop nursing, so that's just a little bit of some of the reasoning um, for that. So many times with newborn foals, if we're getting them a tetanus shot or whatever, those will be done um, in the buttocks right, right along um, side of their tail. Um, there's a lot of different vaccines available, and so I'll just kind of zip through this. Some of these on this side, we really don't talk about a whole lot because we don't see a lot of those issues here in our state. But if you look in a vet supply catalog, there will be vaccines for them. I just don't think you have to do everything if it's not an issue wherever you live. Okay, another thing on health of the horse, and I can't go through everything, um, just mention a little bit on colic, where it basically is a broad name for abdominal pain, okay? So indicators that a horse is a bellyache, you know, he's going to paw, he might get up and down, drop his penis if it's a male horse, maybe kick at their belly. Um, their temperature might be elevated, but their pulse rate and respiration might tend to be, um, tend to be elevated when they have, um, when they're colicking because they're in pain. Okay, and there's a lot of different kinds of colic. Um, here's some more signs as far as pawing. Maybe they'll grind their eat, grind their teeth, um, you know, look at their sides and different kinds of things. If you pay attention to horse, it just looks like they feel bad. Okay, there's a lot of different kinds of things that a horse can colic from. So don't say my horse has the colic. It's like he's colicking, which means he has some type of abdominal pain, abdominal distress. And it can be things from digestive things about from his feed. It can be more serious as some type of obstruction. 
big thing that can cause this is that they're not drinking enough or don't have good enough access to their water. Can be caused from parasites that we're gonna talk about here in just a minute. So there's a lot of different things that can cause a horse to have, um, have colic. Prevention for colic is a lot of really good judicious management stuff as far as our parasite control, as we're gonna talk here in just a minute. Uh, regular feeding, complete free access to water, good exercise, no moldy feeds. So a lot of those basic kinds of things as far as um, with our horse with colic. Every colic and horse doesn't need surgery. That's one option depending on the severity of it. Many of the colic and horse colic can be um, taken care of by different medications, um, nasal gastric tubes and uh, down with your veterinarian to relieve some of the gas or blockages. So there's a lot of different things that a person can do because you want to avoid surgery because it's very expensive and survival rate is not always the greatest. Okay, so moving on to a next area. Okay, and we're gonna talk a little bit about parasites because you can't talk a healthcare plan or health, health with horses without addressing something a little bit on parasites. And so when we get into parasites, kind of your students should really have an idea of some of the, what the main parasites of concern for horses are, and I'll identify probably the six main ones and three that are the most common one. Um, the basic parasitic life cycle, because if you understand that, you can do a little bit better on the management side of it to minimize some of the parasite issues that you might have. How we're gonna deworm our horses, and it's pretty straightforward anymore. Um, and then there's, we have kind of on a new way of our traditional deworming program, or one that it's more um, strategic based where uh, some are recommending that you use fecal egg counts. So basically, parasites on horses, you know, it goes along with good basic management and you can't have, if you have a horse, you've got parasites and you're never going to get rid of them. So we just need to do as good a job as we can to manage it and minimize it. But, you know, you have horses that have a weight loss. If you come onto them and they look like these guys here where they're just unthrifty, you don't know the history on them. The two things that I'm going to do automatically are uh, do float their teeth and deworm them because most likely they've got some kind of issue going along here. You know, a dull hair coat, parasites will contribute to colic issues because everything is moving through the digestive system and they, you can have some pretty serious effects or problems with a big inf infestation of different kinds of parasites. Um, it can hurt your young horse's growth because, um, it, again, it's affecting kind of some of their nutritional um, efficiency if, they're in, if they have a lot of parasites within them. Sometimes it can cause fatal colic depending on what it is and how how significant or how bad they might have them. Um, diarrhea, it's kind of hard to see, but this guy's got some pretty profuse diarrhea going on and some different kinds of bad, serious issues going on. Okay, I know this one is really hard to see it because it, it's fairly um, small, and I'll go through a few of these as we go through um, this presentation. And just to know that there's a variety of different kinds of parasites Many of their life cycle is very similar where they're going to be death, the larva, going to be defecated out through the horse, horse's feces, it's going to get into the ground, they're going to ingest it as they eat, and it's going to go through different areas of the horse's systems, just depends on what that parasite is, and they're going to be fairly, um, each one's going to be fairly unique or have certain different kinds of things that it goes. So there's a lot of them that, that, that affect horses, kind of these are probably the six most common that you'll hear about, um, and the most damaging ones are the largest, small, strong guiles, and the ascaris or the roundworms. We also address tapeworms, pinworms, and bots. And so here on these pictures, these are gonna be some ascarids, and you can see they're kind of na nasty, they're not spaghetti. I got some other pictures that it really looks like spaghetti, but those would be your ascarids. Um, another one that is everybody notices and gets concerned about, but they do less damage, are your bots. And so in the fall of the year, you'll have seahorses that will begin to get these little yellow dots on their legs or different parts of their body. And these are actually bot fly eggs that can get burrowed into um, and attached into the horse's stomach and cause a lot of problems that way. So I'm not gonna go through all of these, um, just kind of hit on a couple of them to show you kind of what their life cycle is. But the large strong guiles are also known as um, the blood worms, and they're considered as one of the most serious. So if you look close, here's a large strong guile, here's a large strong guile, and they do do damage to the horse's blood vessels. So they're a, they're a problem or concern because um, they can penetrate the bowel lining, um, cause anemia, weight loss, um, aneurysms, and different kinds of things like that, okay? when they're in the larval stage really has the greatest threat. And so that's kind of how some of the deworming programs have been targeted. 
their life cycle is very similar to many of our other parasites and so I'm not going to go on all of them because just to give you the basic idea so the larvae are going to be defecated out as the, um, through the horse's manure then they're going to burrow down into um, into the ground and usually hatch and get in on um, some of the, the things that the horse, the horse are going to um, graze on the leaves and the grass and those types of things or your haze or whatever so then the horse ingests it and these are going to go down through um, the horse's mesenteric artery and through the blood system. Many of them are going to have this portion the same, and then when it gets internal, it's going to go different routes. Um, Ascrids are going to go in through the, the lungs of the horse, but the basic life cycle is really not much different. Bots I'll talk about because they are a little bit different because they have what we call an intermediate host, okay? Bad thing with bots is if you have a lot of them, they can rupture the stomach, but the adult is gonna be um, a fly, and which is the intermediate host. So what's different with a bot fly is when they're defecated out, okay, the pupa form goes loose in the soil, and then the fly is gonna be hatched. And so once that fly has been hatched, the fly will go around and lay the eggs on different parts of the horse's body, depending on what type of bot, um, bot fly it actually is. So we have ones um, that will, the common one, that will lay it on their legs. We've got a throat bot fly that will lay it over here. There's a nose fly that will go through here. So there's different types of bot flies and um, kind of varies. So the intermediate host here is your, is your fly. And then depending on what it is, it will, um, once the, the eggs have been laid on the horse, generally they're gonna get hatched and move internally to the horse's system. Here's some that are actually been burrowed in between the horse's teeth. Okay, so then as they go into the horse's system, typically the larvae are going to um, sit and penetrate or attach into the, the stomach of the horse. And then once you deworm them or at, as they mature through a certain stage, they'll be defecated out. You can see here where some of them are kind of been packed into some of the different areas um, of that horse's stomach. So um, goals for a parasite, parasite program is we're gonna, um, we're gonna control it, we can't ever eliminate it because it's just the way it is. So management kinds of things, we can do a lot of those, those deals as far as if your horses are on pasture. Basically, if you think about the life cycle, how are you gonna break up the life cycle? So um, trying to uh, you know, minimize things, uh, rotate your pastures, try not to spread the manure on the pastures, keep your stalls, your dry lots as free of manure as you can minimize those horses eating on the ground which you really aren't going to be able to do because it's just kind of the nature of how they're going to be and any of those different kinds of things on the management side of it can help with your whole program okay how do we control them it's both with management and the different anthelmetics that we have um, we have pace warmers, which I would say probably over 90% 95% of, of all folks that's how they deworm their horses some still do use some as a feed warmer, a daily feed warmer, and many times you also still have to come back and do a tube worming at certain times of the year. Tube worming used to be the main mode that was used, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Pretty much I really don't know anyone that tube worms a horse. This had been before we had all the good paste warmers. Your veterinarian had to put a nasal gastric tube down through his nostril, straight into his stomach, and then um, put the, the anthelmetic right into his stomach. Many of the horses didn't like it very much, um, and so it's very nice that we can be able to pace from these horses anymore. Um, so pros and cons of the current versus future, kind of the current deworming program that most folks use is to deworm them every two or three months, um, kind of treating all the horses together and deworming them on a regular plan where you basically do it yourself. You don't have to use your veterinarian. Um, a, a, a negative with this is many of the um, have found that many, some of the parasites have begun or have formed resistance to some of the anthelmetics. So it may be not as effective as what people think. What they call strategic deworming is basically based on fecal egg counts where each horse is treated as an individual. So you'll take a fecal sample um, have your veterinarian run the egg count and look to see what kind of um, egg count those horses has and make a kind of a, a um, individualized parasite control program for that person. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, it can be more cost effective. It can be more expensive, kind of just depend on how you're doing it. So a traditional program that I think really when I pull folks is what's used most of the time anymore is what we call a slow rotational program where basically folks are gonna deworm every 60 days, maybe every three months. 
Um, typically, I think the most common is used a paste warmer. And um, because on the slow rotational program, as I'll show you here, it's really changing products over to your plan. Uh, in the past, it had been that we would deworm them with the same pro or different products every time, and really was found that that was causing a resistance to occur. So now when we look on a two-year program, where on the first year we will use one type of product as our base warmer, so say a pyrimidine type warmer, which if the product on the shelf, that might be called Strongin C, and deworm those horse every 60 days, then come back with a botticide, because our bot we need to deworm for blots. We usually say after the flies are gone, so after our first killing frost, and then again in the spring before the flies come. And not every product is effective against bots, but we know that ivermectin is. So many of the organophosphates are also effective against bots. Um, some folks don't like ivermectin mainly because it's a little bit more pricey. So if you've got several horses, you might look for something else, but making sure that we do use something that will, is effective against the bots, both in the fall and in the spring. Um, Sometimes we need to watch for tapeworms, and so many of the products you can look to see on the packaging to make sure it is effective also against the tapeworms about twice a year. Then the following year, we'll come back with a different type of base worm or so a benzimidol, for example, um, which is a different type of product than the pyrimidines, which off the shelf, one, one product of that is an amplified EQ. Again, use it for the every, every um, two to three months, and the rest of it would be very much the same as far as something for the bots and something for the tapeworms, both in the spring, excuse me, um, and in the fall. Sorry, my light goes off. <laughs> um, so that's kind of the traditional program that most folks, folks are on. Um, as far as the resistance, they found some resistance with some of the different parasites as far as small, strong aisles to the benzimidols. Um, different ones to the pyrimidines, and so they've kind of gotten a little concerned about some of the, the various kinds of rotational dewormers that folks have used. A little bit more on our management again, you know, is um, basically preventing pasture contamination, um, getting rid of the manure. A lot of folks say don't spread it on your fields, but for many of us that's not an option, and so trying to mix it up as best you can and minimize that, because you're basically thinking about the parasite con um, life cycle and trying to minimize um, how you can break that up. And so here's some more things with our basic management and some things like that. You know, using feeders for your hay and grain, um, not feeding them off the ground all the time, but if they're on pasture, that's what they're gonna be doing, okay? Just had a student here today asking about the little white eggs, and I says, well, you can go ahead and start trying to get them off your horse's hair coat, which in the fall is something that you see very often. Um, okay, so moving on, um, to another area that I'll just touch on again briefly is um, some of the dental care and aging, okay? So some of the very basics with this is the basic of aging a horse by its teeth. You can break it down and get real specific, but I think some of the very basic things is good for them to understand, um, such as being able to see a young horse versus an aged horse by what their teeth are showing. Um, some of the common dental problems and how we can do some preventive dental maintenance to minimize some of those different kinds of things. So um, as far as some basic stuff with equine dentistry, you know, their systems are made to eat roughage or grasses, and that's um, not always what everybody does, but they have to be able to chew that to utilize it. And so as horses get older, we need to wash their teeth to make sure that they're able to utilize their feet as efficiently because really our forages are the most um, efficient and the most economical thing for them. And anytime I see a thin horse, the first two things that come to mind as far as what we need to look at are their teeth and have they been dewormed. And because of our dental care has improved dramatically over the last 20 to 30 years, we have a lot more older horses, a lot of horses that were extremely thin and we fix their teeth and they go on and last for a very long amount of time. I'm not going to get real in depth on the dental thing on the teeth anatomy. Basically, you know that 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 um, <coughs> we've got both of our upper and lower incisors, the canines, and then the upper molars and the lower molars. And be sure to understand that these horses, um, their teeth continue to erupt. And so, if they lose one tooth the, on the opposite end, you need to make sure that you are checking these teeth routinely because this lower tooth could grow up in, into the upper gum if they've lost a tooth or been extracted for whatever reason that it might be. Um, which horse is older and which horse is younger? The angle is going to get um, more um, 
a stronger angle, a bigger angle as they age. So just in general looking at them, this is going to be a younger horse. You won't, the, the, the front teeth, they'll say an old horse is long in its tooth because look at the difference of the front teeth of this horse versus this horse. And so even you naturally, you're not going to be able to see their skull. But even just looking at those horses, when you open their lips, you can tell that this horse is obviously quite a bit older than what this horse is here. Um, the horse's teeth, if you get really into this, um, they will change shape and um, the table service and wear services will change dramatically as they age. And some folks get very much into this and are very, very good at aging a horse by their teeth. But <coughs> um, you can look, your five-year-old horse are going to be more rounded and the different areas as far as um, the dentin, the, the, the dental star, the enamel and those things is going to be more prominent. Eight years, um, the dental star is going to begin to appear, and the teeth are getting a bit more triangular. Okay, at 12 years, you've got um, the basic this enamel area is pretty much gone. Uh, 18 years, you can see 24 years, and there's other things that come into play, such as Gelvin's groove and different kinds of things like that. But this is just a very kind of broad, just um, quick overview of looking at some of the major changes as a horse gets quite a bit older. Issues and problems, um, these are some good slides that I stole off the internet in different places, but um, a lot of the problems include um, sharp points, so you can see these sharp points here. All of their teeth should be smooth like these are, and these are some sharp points that have, dug, that, that have grown out. So these horses can begin to develop sores in their cheeks when they, um, sometimes if they start getting real irritate, irritating and mad when you ride them, if these hit on the bridle, that can drive them crazy. And so um, those are some things that your veterinarian will come and float, float off and take off. Um, because if you run and start running into some behavior, behavior problems, these are some of the things that they might notice and see. Um, caps, uh, your young horses um, will have caps as their the permanent teeth are coming in over here. And so many times those, the veterinarian needs to come and kind of just pry those caps off at a certain age to reduce some of those different kinds of things. Wolf teeth are also remnants of, of um, oh, remnants of, of um, some of their old teeth that are up in the front, and also that something else is a two-year-old. Your veterinarian should look to see if the horse has them. They don't all have them, but if they have them, they really should take them off. Here's some more hooks and some sharp points you can see here. Okay, you can see some ulcers down here, some sores, and they've gone in and floated this horse and made it smooth. So this can cause issues as far as if they've got sores, they might not be eating very well, they might be dropping feed, chewing, chewing sideways, the bit might start to drive them crazy and things like that, and it's very, um, and so it's good practice to have your vet come in and check those. They can feel, they can see those, and then they'll float those off, rasp those off. A um, few other things to notice, um, you know, that they drop the feed when they chew, they've lost weight, um, they have large or undigested particles um, in the manure because they're just not using it. This horse, if he looks funny in front, then most likely when they open their mouth in the back, they've got some issues going on in back because you can see this horse is kind of lopsided and he's been chewing off to one side. I would put money on it that he's got sores and hooks and stuff in the back because the back is what's causing the front to, for this. You might not see this, but you'll notice some of these different kinds of things that your horse begins to do. Um, other things, you know, head tilting, this is a really big hook on this horse. Um, you know, fighting the bit, they just, they, they just don't ride with the bridle quite as well. Um, sometimes you'll see him get a foul odor, okay, through their, in their mouth. Um, we had one horse and she had just a little tiny um, pus coming out of her nose and then her, her, her breath really stunk and so when we went to figure it out, she had an abscess tooth and we needed to get rid of that abscess tooth. She also had a little pus pocket underneath and it was an abscess tooth that was causing all those kinds of things. And so she had a lot of those issues. Once we got rid of the abscess tooth, then she was a much happier camper. Um, preventive maintenance, what your veterinarian will do as an owner, you need to have any adult horse checked at least once a year. And then if you have a horse with no known problems, it might need to be twice a year. And floating um, is what we call it when they, they'll come in and they need to anesthetize the horse, um, put a mouth speculum on them, which is this, to help hold the horse's mouth open, and then go in there and basically um, rasp off, uh, file off those horse's teeth. Most veterinarians now, if you can see, she's using a power float, which is a great big version of what your dentist uses um, to rasp them off. There's also hand floats, but the power floats are much easier. Um, 
on both the individual performing um, floating the teeth and also the horses. And I already mentioned about routine examinations, um, looking for things. If you know you have a horse with a problem, then maybe every six months, different things, um, and um, to really watch those horses. Okay, moving off of the dental thing, here's just a little bit on some of the emergency first aid. Um, and we've got in the resources some videos of some of these kinds of things, and these might be some of the things that we do ask um, the, the, the contestants to do as they come through. Put it on leg wraps. Um, here's a, a, an illustration of the correct way to do it. Um, and also there's some videos I sh I'll show you that we did put in here um, to go and look to see how to correctly put a leg wrap on. Foot wraps would be this type of deal here where they've got some kind of issue going on in the bottom of their foot, so we need to protect the bottom of the horse's foot. Um, uh, so this is where we're actually soaking a foot. Different ways to restrain a horse, which are mainly going to be the different types of twitches that we have, and how you can safely put those on um, your horses. Um, so possible skill things, we've got some stuff about wrapping legs. Um, also wound care, which goes along with wrapping the legs and their feet. Okay. Uh, taking their vital signs and we've got some video things that we've stuck in here about how to take the temperature pulse respiration estimate a horse's weight we can get you some of those references we've also used that in some of the other um, segments that we've done injection sites I mentioned that earlier aging their by teeth basic restraint or all some of the different kinds of things that we might have um, have the contestants do equipment different kinds of things you know I'm using some different things here uh, stethoscopes, thermometers, hobbles, uh, we'll probably have some different kinds of floats, mouth speculums, you know, any different of these different kinds of things that we might use where it's related to um, health of our horses. I've stuck some of the um, resources in here that you also might have them go in and look at. Um, many of these are different, um, either YouTube videos or webinars that I either use in my other classes or have been a part of that are going to give them a little bit more information, um, more in depth than probably what I've had a chance to go through in here. So with that, um, I know I went through a lot of stuff relatively fast. Um, basically, I think the idea is that we just give you kind of the basics and give you some ideas like, of how to um, funnel your contestants onto getting them some good background um, here. and. I know we don't have hardly any in here. If we've got some questions on it, um, I'd be more than happy to entertain them. Uh, and with that, I think we can pull her to a close. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Anderson. Uh, we greatly appreciate uh, uh, your discussion on equine health. I know I learned something and we greatly appreciate it. Our next webinar will be Thursday, October 18th. That'll focus on poultry, business management, marketing, and product evaluation. Thank you much and have a good day, everyone.